Welcome to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast, where Pastor Jeff Cranston, along with our host, Jen Denton, will discuss biblical theology in an understandable way. You'll discover how to apply biblical truth to your life. Thanks for joining us at the table. Let's get started. Hello again, and welcome to Kitchen Table Theology. I'm your host, Jen Denton, and along with Pastor Jeff Cranston, we're discovering what the Scripture teaches regarding theological topics. Our goal is to always attempt to put those theological cookies on the bottom shelf where we can all reach them. And we try to do this in a way that's very applicable to the lives we live, because the real power of theology is not only knowing it, but applying it. We do this because we agree with what the German theologian Karl Barth once said, in the Church of Jesus Christ, there can and should be no non-theologians. We want to help you become a good theologian who knows, understands, and can discuss the doctrines of the Bible. We want to help you be strong in your faith, knowledgeable in and of the Word, and growing in your love for Jesus. Today is our first episode in a new series on the church. The doctrine of the church is also known as the doctrine of ecclesiology. And over the course of this series, we'll delve into seven snapshots of what the New Testament teaches about the church. The New Testament says that the church is a flock, fellowship, a body, a bride, a family, as God's house and a priesthood. And actually, it says a whole lot more. There's study and came up with like 86 of those metaphors for what the church is, but we're just going to focus in on seven. Why not 86? I'm sure everyone would love to go along for the ride on that. It probably (laughs) would be really good for us, but we're just going to go with the perfect number of seven. Well, we've still got seven, so let's go ahead and get started on that. But before we dive in... Before we dive in... We want to hear a follow-up, because in episode 59, we were talking about reconciliation. Yes. And you said, if I remember right, so correct me on what I might be wrong... You have two aunts. It's my grandma oh, and her sister. Your grandmother sister. and her mm-hmm. sister. So mm-hmm. your grandmother and your great aunt. And my great aunt. And they had not spoken for 50 years? I think they had spoken a little bit here and there, but they had not seen Seen one another. Yes. Living in different states? Different states, just barely. <laughs> just barely. <laughs> so close enough for a short car drive. Oh, close enough. For sure. But when we did episode 59, they were going to see each other that next week. The next so week, we're yes. all dying to know what happened. Do, actually, we, do you have a good story? I, well, I mean, I have a story. I don't know if it's a good one because it's kind of anticlimactic. I think at that age, you just get to a point where, I don't know, are you just too tired to even go back and hash it all or out remember anymore why not, or, re- or remember yeah. why. And I think, honestly, I think that's a big part of it. They just got into this mode for so long that I don't think they could even go back and hash it out because there wasn't a foundation to stand on. So I think they had a lovely visit. They, they saw each other. Together. They talked. They, they hugged. They talked. They hugged. I think they so planned there was... another get together. Maybe. Wow. Five decades from now, but yeah. So bygones, that's good. bygones, and we move forward. All right. Well, that's good news. Well, but we we have all been waiting to hear for two weeks. We've been waiting to hear that. I wish I had. You know, they came to blows, and my grandma won, and so you know that kind of story. Yeah, but, that sounds like yeah. you. Yeah, you would like that. <laughs> she claimed victory, but no, nothing as exciting as that. But I am glad that you know you, you don't want to as your your senior year of life, you don't want to have any kind of regrets and you don't no. want to hold on to any kind of angst. No, that's good. Animosity. I'm glad. So, glad yeah. to hear that. It's good for the soul. Good for the soul. So again, before we dive in, <laughs> let's get back to this first of the seven that we're going to address today. And we threw out a word there that maybe a lot of us aren't familiar with, ecclesiology. So perhaps it's a good idea to define that term and tell us what that has to do with the church. Yeah, good place to start. And hello again, Kitchen Table Theology family. Thanks for joining Jen and I as we begin to study a topic that I have given my life to, really. I honestly really have. And it's more than a topic, to be sure, but it's the church of Jesus Christ. I love his church with all my heart, and I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to taking the next seven podcasts and talking about his bride. So the word ecclesiology is a theological term used by, guess who? primarily theologians. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, it didn't take you long to get there. (laughs) And it just refers to the church. So the English word church that we have 
is translated from the Greek word ekklesia, therefore ecclesiology. And ecclesia is derived from the word ek, E-K, and that means out of, and another Greek word, kaleo, which means to call. So hence the church is called out ones or a called out group. Ecclesia, that word appears 114 times in the New Testament, three in the Gospels, and 111 in the Epistles. Now, while it has a little bit of a variance in its meaning, the word is used almost always to designate the New Testament church, a group of called out believers in Jesus Christ. So our theological term, ecclesiology, comes from the Greek word for called out ones, ecclesia. So that, that's probably more than you wanted to know. No, I think that's super interesting, and I'm sure our kitchen table theologians will find it helpful as well. But knowing you, I bet there's (laughs) something else you want to tell us about that. (laughs) Well, you're getting to know me too well. Well, there is, I suppose, and something that maybe I only I will find it interesting, but I do. But I'll make it very short and sweet. So the English word church is related to the Scottish word kirk. And it's related to the German word Kirch, okay? Now, all three of those words, the Scots, the Germans, the English, derive all from the Greek word kuriakon, which is a form of the word kurios, the word for Lord. And I just found that really interesting. So, therefore, it's also true that the word church means belonging to the Lord. So, we can believe that's part of the definition, too. So if we boil that down a little bit, what I hear in those two aspects of ecclesiology is that we, the church, are called out, and we are called to. Very well said, yeah. The church is called out. I guess we would say the church is called out from the world, and we're called out from our previous ungodly lifestyles, and then there's a sense we're being called to, or we're called together for a purpose, and that purpose is to worship God, to follow Jesus, to carry out the Great Commission. I like that because it's a three-part succinct definition that can help explain. I've often said the church is not four walls, and if someone wants to put, you know, some flesh on those bones, what do you mean by that? Then saying that we are called out, called to, and called together is a really great way to define that, for sure. Once again, could not have said it better myself, and you've just put the theological cookies on the bottom shelf, Jen. Well, I need to reach them, so I've got to put them (laughs) down there for myself. Well, hey, let's jump in on something that might not be quite as deep, but is equally as important. Let's begin looking at the metaphors that the New Testament uses when referencing the church. We mentioned the seven that we'll be examining just moments ago, and today's podcast will focus on the first metaphor, which is the church is a flock. And this is Jesus's favorite description of the church. In Luke's gospel, he called it my little flock. You know, I've been blessed to visit the nation of New Zealand four different times, and I'd love that country. I'd go tomorrow if I could. One of those trips, I spent a month there, and I was staying in a cabin slash shed in a park (laughs) writing my master's thesis. And I'm wondering now how I ever wrote my 188-page master's thesis without the internet. No, I had nothing. That's a, that's a bold... Nothing. That's a bold accomplishment I right there, carried, my friend. <laughs> I carried so many books to New Zealand, oh, and I was goodness. I was dozens of miles from a library, mm-hmm. much less a theological... Mm-hmm. And, and anyway, so while I was there for that month, I was writing my master's thesis, and I was also the interim pastor of a small congregation in the city of Rotorua, New Zealand. Well, what I quickly discovered was... You can't go anywhere in New Zealand and not see sheep. And when I was there, and this was the late 90s, the nation had a population of about 3.3 million people. That, that was all. But there were over 30 million sheep. And I had the 9. opportunity... 9.7 sheep per every Oh, it was... Person. When I say you can't go anywhere and not see sheep, I'm not, oh I'm not, I'm not just lying about it. It's, they're everywhere. Oh, my goodness. And I'm sure that's still... the. I'm guessing the percentages are probably still very similar. But while I was there, I had the opportunity to visit a working sheep ranch... And it really was an amazing experience because I got to watch the shepherd through whistle commands work these border collies who are among, you know, just like your dog, Peppa, (laughs) among the smartest canines on the planet. But boy, it was something I'll never forget watching that happen. But I remember at one point the sheep all got mashed in together into this corner of the paddock. 
and the shepherd wanted them to turn around and come back out into the paddock so they weren't all crammed in there together. And he gave his commands. The border collie literally jumped up on the backs of the sheep and ran across hundreds of sheep, got down the very corner, got himself down the ground, turned around, started barking and carrying on. Those sheep all turned around and scattered. It was just cool. And that was just one of the common sights that you saw running around there. It was awesome. I saw a movie about a pig that herded sheep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Babe. <laughs> Based on a true story, was it? I'm sure it was. He I'm was sure it was. Yeah. <laughs> I have but one no, they... word. I have one word for you here. Yes. Bacon. Oh, no. <laughs> I still say I'm going to have a pet pig one day. But let's move along. Let's not go down that rabbit trail today. <laughs> okay. Well, all of that, I'm saying all that is because wherever sheep. you went, sheep were and are a very common sight in New Zealand. And sheep were an incredibly common sight in first century Palestine. It's still not an uncommon sight in Israel today. And so it's not hard to understand why the metaphor of a flock of sheep was applied to the church. Mm -hmm. So the flock of God is one of the most practical illustrations of Christ and the church. And and Jen, if you'll read this verse out of Acts 20, 28, Paul was talking to the elders at the Ephesians church, and he said these words. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, Peter, so that's Paul. Peter used the picture of a flock, and he instructed elders to shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, etc. So you see both Paul and Peter, in addition to Jesus, using this metaphor, not only of sheep, but of a shepherd. And Jesus used the flock and the shepherd to illustrate the relationship between himself and his followers. In John 10, he says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. He's referring there to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. I think we can all buy into the loving concept of the shepherd, but I don't know that I like being called a sheep. <laughs> Do know, tell. Far be it for me to go against any of this, but there's you're, a, you're just going to go against Jesus, Paul, and Peter, I right? Guess, is, that, is that where I guess, we're headed here? But, I mean, think about things that I don't know, that we know about sheep. If we Google characteristics of sheep, I imagine there are some interesting things that come up. In fact, it's I have good. a little list. Oh, I do. Let's I do. go. All right. Here's some common tendencies and characteristics of sheep. They are timid, fearful, easily panicked. Here's my favorite. Dumb, stupid, gullible. They stampede easily, and they're vulnerable to a mob. I'm assuming a mob. It says mob psychology. I'm assuming it's like a mob mentality. What? Yeah. Yeah. I would think so. Oh, that's, that might be a little bit true right there. So let's sidestep that one. I think so far they're all true. but <laughs> Little or no means of self-defense. <laughs> they can only run. And if they're full of wool, they can't run Well, if they're much. full of wool, they sometimes they fall over. They fall over. That might be kind of true about some of us. And they too. can't get up. And they can't get up. Right. So, I mean, kind of like turtles if they fall over on yeah. their back. They're jealous. They compete for dominance. They're easily killed by enemies. And they need the most care of pretty much any other livestock. I mean, they appear cuddly and warm and soft, and I don't know, maybe they they sparkle in the minds of young children that want to pet one, but I I don't think that they necessarily brought the potato salad to the Mensa <laughs> Club picnic, for sure. Not the smartest of the bunch. Yeah, the illustration, the metaphor of us as sheep is not, let's just say it's not flattering, but it's really true. Yeah, I, mean, it, I, I have to say I felt some conviction <laughs> as I went through that list for sure. <laughs> you know, the Bible consistently, consistently refers to the church, the people of God as a flock of sheep, and we need food and protection and direction, and we need help. You know, when you said they fall down, they can't get up, they really will. And they will sometimes starve to death because they've got so much wool they're carrying around. They cannot right themselves. And unless the shepherd comes along and turn, gets them back up on their feet, they're going to die. A lot, lot of truth to that. <laughs> Uh, they are very, very needy creatures. One theologian I read said this, a long list of specific items could doubtless be offered at this point. In other words, the characteristics of sheep. But it seems that they could all be summarized under provision, particularly the provision of spiritual food. So I think as I've looked at these seven topics, metaphors that we're going to look at over the next seven podcasts, Lord willing, there's a key word I think that goes along with every one of them. And let me just lay these 
these out and then we'll touch on them as, as we go Great. over the next few weeks. But you think of a flock, we're called a flock. Well, the key word there is provision. We need God's provision. And then you said, we're going to look at fellowship. Well, what is that? That's community. Then we're referred to as the body of Christ. What is that? That's unity. And Paul in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians said, you know, the hand can't say the eye or, you know, I don't have any need of you and the eye can't say the foot. I don't need you. There's the whole concept of unity in the body metaphor. And then you've got the bride metaphor where the bride of Christ, what is that? That's intimacy and that, that intimacy that we have with the father. And then the metaphor of family. Well, what is that? Identity. Uh, you know, you're a member of God's family. And then we're referred to as a building or a house, and the key word there is indwelling. God's Spirit indwells us. And then the final metaphor we're going to look at is priesthood. We're called a kingdom of priests. And what is that? That's service. The priests served in the temple. So the shepherd provides. So back to our key word for today, provision. The shepherd provides for his sheep. Another theologian that I read, Dr. Robert Saucy, he summarized all this really well. I want to read you a couple of sentences of his. He said this, the sheep can provide nothing for itself and can only prosper as it follows the direction of the shepherd. Its only obligation is to submit to his leading and authority. Thus, the church is directed as the flock of God to submit to his authority and that of the chief shepherd. That's Jesus. Because this direction is communicated through the word and the ministry of the under shepherds, which God has placed in the church, the members are exhorted to obey them that have the rule over to lead you and submit yourselves. That's Hebrews 13. 17. And then lastly, as even the leaders of the church are sheep, they also are obligated to submit ultimately to the chief shepherd. And that's in his book, The Church in God's Program. And we will source that book for you in our episode notes. Okay, so it's well established then that we are sheep and the church is a flock. But in that last quote, you just mentioned something that I don't think we should overlook. Let's give a little bit more attention to. You gave the term under shepherds, which I'm assuming are pastors, right? Right. Because every flock has to be led and cared for by a shepherd or shepherds. Yeah, and that's, that's a good point, because if we were going to talk about a church being a flock and we don't reference under shepherds or we don't reference the chief shepherd, we wouldn't be doing this justice at all. So since the church is a flock, it's cared for and led by shepherds. Now, there are three different terms that are used in the New Testament to refer to the same church leader, to the under shepherd. The first is a Greek word poimen, and that means pastor or shepherd. So that means the feeders are the leaders, the feeding aspect of ministry. Ministry, where Jesus says to Peter, you remember, take care of my sheep, take care of my... That's the word poimen. It's the word pastor or shepherd. Shepherd my sheep. That's what Jesus is telling Peter. So pastor means to take care of a flock. Poimen. The second Greek word used for the under shepherd is the Greek word presbyteros. And that means elder in Greek. Presbyterian comes from this word. Presbyterians call their leaders elders. It's a good, legitimate Bible term. It refers to spiritual maturity. Now, an elder doesn't mean physically old. It means spiritually mature. Timothy was the elder and under-shepherd, the chief pastor of the church at Ephesus. Paul said, you're the elder, you're the pastor at Ephesus, you are to appoint other elders. And yet later in the very same book, I believe it's in 1 Timothy, he says, don't let anybody look down on you because you're a young kid. So how could he be an elder and yet a young man, very young man at the same time? Well, because Timothy had been a Christian since he was a child, and although he might have been 25 or 30 years old, he'd been a Christian for probably two decades. So whereas these guys who were older than him had only been Christians for a year, how do we know that? Because Paul just went through Ephesus, you know, a year or two ago. So anybody who was in the faith could not have been more than a couple of years old in the faith. So that presbyteros words referring to spiritual maturity, not necessarily physical maturity. The third word referring to the pastors under shepherds, leaders, is episkopos. And that's the word often translated overseer or bishop. So Episcopalian comes from this word. In the Episcopal Church, they call their leaders bishops. Nothing wrong with that. Good, solid, biblical word. So Episcopalian or episkopos, epi, the first, the prefix in Greek means over, and the word skopos means to see. So we see the word skopos in our English words, telescope, microscope, stethoscope. You know, you can see better. So they're overseers. So that's what episkopos means. Today, we might call them a manager. So a bishop, in that sense of the word, is a spiritual overseer, a spiritual manager, or a supervisor. And that word refers to the managing aspects of church leadership. So once again, we've got three words in the New Testament, 
for one of our English words. Yeah, that happens a lot. Sensing a pattern here. Yeah. (laughs) So what then is the difference between a pastor and an elder, or an elder and a bishop, or a bishop and a shepherd, or a shepherd and an overseer? Nothing. Nothing. (laughs) No, there really is nothing, really. The words are used, those three words are used interchangeably in the New Testament. Today, we seem to be much more hung up on titles than they were in the New Testament days, but you read these words, and it's all this is taught all throughout the New Testament. All right, well, at least give us some examples then. I'm going to push you. (laughs) All right. Okay, so 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2. So I'll throw the Greek word in after the English word, because this is very interesting. So he says, to the elders, I say, be shepherds of God's flock. All right, rewind. To the elders, presbyteros, I say, be shepherds, poimen, of God's flock. So he says, an elder is a shepherd, is a pastor. And then he says, serving as overseers, that's the word episkopos. So a bishop is an elder, is a pastor. In Acts 20, Paul, we read this, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. So Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders, presbyteros of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, guard yourselves and all the flock of God, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, episkopos. Be pastors, poimen, of the church of God. So an elder is, an overseer is a pastor. The words are used interchangeably. And those of us, like me, who fit one of those bills as an under-shepherd, we readily acknowledge that we serve under the one great and chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the chief shepherd, the great shepherd. And I imagine that that's something you're thankful for on Almost a daily basis. <laughs> Almost an hourly, if not minute by minute, minute basis. By minute basis. Yeah. Because... Especially when things go wrong, you go, "Hey, it's your it's your church. What are you doing? You're you're messing this up. It, it can't be me." No. Well, that is a lot to digest today. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up today's podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please recommend this podcast to your friends and family and do share it on social media. Also, please subscribe wherever you get your podcast and leave a rating or a comment because, again, they really help us get the word out about Kitchen Table Theology. Please check out today's episode notes. I know we mentioned at least one reference that it's going to be in there today. And don't forget to head over to jeffcranston.com freely access our podcast archives and other resources to help your faith journey like Pastor Jeff's sermons, his books, and his blog. We have another Q&A coming up soon, so drop us a question via email to pastorjeff at lowcountrycc.org or watch Pastor Jeff's Instagram at Pastor Jeff Cranston, where we'll be asking for your questions. Our next podcast will continue this topic of ecclesiology, but we're going to be focusing on the church as a fellowship. Thanks for joining us today, and remember, The real power of theology is not just knowing it, but applying it. You've been listening to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast with Jen Denton and Pastor Jeff Cranston. Join us next time for more insights into biblical truth. If you'd like to know more on today's topic, you can check out the show notes at jeffcranston.com. You can also email us at pastorjeff at lowcountrycc.org. If you're enjoying this podcast, would you consider leaving a rating and review on iTunes? We deeply appreciate your help in getting the word out. And be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or in your favorite podcasting app to continue this journey with us as we learn about and apply God's word to our lives. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here at Kitchen Table Theology.